Good evening, everyone. My name is Anna Gee, and I run the Ames Moot Court competition for the Board of Student Advisors. <laughs> Welcome to the Ames Moot Court final round. Presiding over this year's competition are the Honorable Sonia Sotomayor of the Supreme Court of the United States, the Honorable Susan L. Carney of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, and the Honorable Jennifer Walker Elrod of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Tonight's case was written by Elizabeth Barkas Prelogger and Tejinder Singh. This evening's case poses two key questions. First, whether a statute prohibiting an individual from possessing a firearm if he's been convicted of a criminal offense punishable by more than two years of imprisonment violates the Second Amendment. And second, whether a statute prohibiting individuals from publishing CAD files on the internet that can be used to program a 3D printer to print a firearm violates the free speech clause of the First Amendment. Representing the petitioner, the Grace Murray Hopper Memorial Team, Max Gottschall, oralist, Erica Herrera, Benjamin Lewis, Catherine McCaffrey, oralist, Eliza McDuffie, and Jacqueline Salberg. Representing the respondent, the Clarence Earl Gideon Memorial Team, Jeff Adler, Nick Akar, oralist, Gabrielle Belzel, Marlon Golden, oralist, Lily Kim, and Daniel Morales. Please silence all phone and electronic devices. Please no photos and please avoid leading the court, leaving the courtroom during argument. Thank you and enjoy the competition. All rise. The Honorable, the Chief Justice, and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oyez, oyez, oyez. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Please have a seat. Petitioners, are you ready? Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Max Gottschall, and on behalf of Petitioner Ian Groves, I will address the First Amendment issue. We would like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Two years ago, Mr. Groves created a digital design for a single-shot plastic firearm. Following instructions provided by Groves, that design can be used to 3D print a set of parts, which can then be assembled into the firearm. Although similar designs have been accessible online for years, Ames is the only state in the nation to have made it a felony to publish such designs on the internet. That law violates the First Amendment for three reasons. First, under this court's precedence in Bartnicki and Free Speech Coalition, the law impermissibly targets Groves' speech to prevent third parties' criminal conduct. Second, the law is significantly over-inclusive because it prevents Groves from sharing his design with the many citizens of Ames who will not put it to harmful uses. Third and finally, the law is a facially content-based regulation of speech that the state has not justified as actually necessary to solve a current problem. Counselor, why should we be looking our, at our established precedent? Isn't this a new form of technology? Your Honor. And given that it is, shouldn't we be thinking about it in a different way? Your Honor. This is the first bit of technology that I've ever seen that can direct another machine to create an item that could be put to dangerous use. Uh, Your Honor, several points on that. First, I think with respect, this is uh, an old kind of speech. It's a blueprint, it's a design uh, for an object. The difference is that on the user end, a person now has access to technology, expensive technology, that can, uh, following the direction no, by that... No, giving, it's giving. This technology can be used to give a machine directions on how to manufacture a dangerous item. This is very different than any blueprint that we've permitted in the past. Those blueprints require um, an individual to actually follow them, 
assemble all of the mechanisms necessary to put them into effect. It's one thing to build a building. You've got to get a lot of things to build that building. Here, all you need is a 3D printer, essentially. Well, Your Honor, I think you need the 3D printer. I think you also need the appropriate raw materials. You also need uh, a significant amount of technical know-how to know how to operate it. No doubt it's easier than building a building, but we still submit there's quite a bit of uh, knowledge and expertise that goes into the downloader side uh, before a person can take this, this file and turn it into a working firearm. Uh, in particular, Your Honor, it's our submission, as we say in our brief, that the kind of files that uh, our client wants to upload to the Internet uh, actually cannot direct a 3D printer to do anything at all. They need to be altered on the downloader and, uh, as we say in our opening brief, sliced uh, before they can actually communicate to a 3D printer. And we think that makes, that makes some difference. These really are nothing more than digital versions uh, of blueprints or of other uh, descriptions, visual or otherwise, of objects. And so we think it's better to think of this as the dissemination of those kinds of blueprints. And that, uh, we think, under this court's precedence in Sorrell, and in Bartnicki, the dissemination of that kind of truthful information is protected speech. And uh, the fact that it can be used on the downloader end and put to unlawful ends, uh, if the person so chooses, doesn't change that fact. Why but is it that your client made a CAD that didn't require the use of a metal part so detectors could work on it? I know that he has a metal a slot in which a metal part can be placed, but isn't his intent to actually facilitate the illegal transport of a gun through security? Uh, Your Honor, I don't think that's Mr. Groves' intent. He did if as- If it wasn't his intent, why didn't he make a pedal piece a necessary part of the gun? Your Honor, the record is not clear on that, and I'm not sure why he didn't, but he did, I think, do everything an uploader of this kind of information could do to ensure that when it was 3D printed, the firearm would be metal detectable, because as the record reflects at uh, the Joint Appendix 18, the design includes a hole where a metal slug can be inputted, and indeed- But it has no functional use. That's right, Your Honor, but it's our understanding that it would be difficult, I think, to, to require that, uh, to, to make the metal piece uh, be used, but it's our Would submission. Would this law be legal if it required that? Your Honor, that's one of the less restrictive alternatives that we, uh, that we suggest. Is Wouldn't the, that be a violation of the First Amendment? You'd be up here arguing that we were forcing him to speak in a way he didn't want to speak. Your Honor, I don't think that we would be saying that this was a sort of compelled speech situation. And you're right that under the principles, Your Honor is correct, and under the principles we think resolve this case in Ashcroft and, Free and uh, Bartnicki, that it would be still going after Groves' speech uh, because some third person, quite apart from that speech, would be using it to commit a criminal act. It's important to note here that just as it would be a third person's independent choice to take this firearm once it was assembled and use it to commit a crime, it's also an independent choice on the part of the downloader to choose not to insert the metal slug that Groves has instructed people who download this firearm uh, to do. So we think uh, either way, the, this is still going after speech because the government is worried that some listeners for that speech will put it to unlawful uses. And that gets to the second core point I would like to make about this law being significantly over-inclusive. We think this law is really no different than regulating all uh, leafleting to prevent littering. Of course, some recipients of leaflets, as this court said in the Schneider case, will put it uh, to the littering use, but where the state retains the power to go after littering primarily, it is not allowed to go after the leafleting, even though that would perhaps be a slightly more effective way of advancing their goals. Could you, could you speak to the import of the statute's restriction on publication to the internet? Other modes of publication are made available. You've made a, an argument that um, making the uh, uh, schema uh, schematics available is important to artistic and scientific and entertainment, serves other kind of communicative values. But um, your client has available to him other means of publication, that is offline sharing and um, just less broad and um, uh, perhaps unobservable um, ways of uh, serving those other purposes while mitigating the risk 
uh, uh, that would be uh, created by internet publication. Why isn't this is just a kind of time, place, and manner restriction that's tolerable in this, these circumstances? Sure, Your Honor. Two points on that. First and foremost, we do not submit it's, it's properly analyzed as a time, place, manner restriction because it's our submission that it's a facially content-based regulation of the speech. And as this court said precisely on point in the Reno case, if it is a content-based regulation of speech, then even regulating various uh, modalities of internet communication, as the court said, is not permissible because time, place, manner analysis is not permissible for facially content-based regulations. But uh, Your Honor brings up an important point about the use of the internet here, and I think the one uh, piece of communication that really can't be achieved by not being able to share this with all the, the citizens of Ames who will put it to lawful and valuable uses is that the internet, as this court said in Reno, is uh, a more powerful soapbox than ever before. And as this court said in Packingham just, just two terms ago, is, is the, probably the most important way now that citizens share information with each other, both to speak and to listen. And Does this statute uh, prevent you from putting up a website that would say that you would send this to anyone who wants it and then sending it in a drive to somebody? Does, does that, is that prohibited? Your Honor, I think that's probably not prohibited. Uh, I think, certainly I don't think the state thinks that would be prohibited since that's what they argue. And uh, I don't think that would be making the file itself available on the internet, which I think is what the statute requires. I'm sorry, why? You why? get on a website, you list that you have this CAD program. If you want it, ask us for us. Tell us who you are. Right, and Your Honor, our submission would be, if we understand the statute correctly, that's not covered by the statute. But exactly. So why isn't that an adequate alternative? Well, He's I think not being barred from a website at all. Well, at first, I think it's, uh, the adequate alternatives analysis would only matter if this law were evaluated under intermediate scrutiny rather than strict scrutiny, we should, which we submit it should not be. But second, I think there is still something quite different. Well, this is not quite speech. It's speech that acts. So why should it be subject to strict scrutiny? We well, honor our, it's our submission that it is speech and it's protected speech because the act criminalized by the statute is not the use of this file or directing a 3D printer to do anything. It's the publication, the dissemination of this design, of this blueprint from person to person using the internet as a medium. And we submit just as this court said in Bartnicki and in Sorrell, it strongly suggested that when a person has information, especially truthful information, and is prevented from disseminating it as they see fit, that's a restriction on their right to speak. Are you saying this is a per se prior restraint on speech? Your Honor, we don't evaluate it under a prior restraint approach because unlike the, uh, the use of the export regulations in the defense distributed mm -hmm. case, this simply imposes a, a quite severe criminal penalty So that's afterwards. after the fact, you're Correct. not enjoined in any way? There hasn't been an injunction and we don't think the statute uh, provides for that, no. But we still think just like the use of the, the ITAR law in the defense distributed case, this is a content-based regulation of speech and should thus be subject to strict scrutiny. Well, these have been around for a long time and maybe that's, you. I think you think that's a plus, but have any courts grappled with these issues? Your Honor, the defense distributed litigation in the Fifth Circuit, I think, did grapple with it. But uh, the district court there really didn't an analyze the First Amendment issue very much at all they, it, because it was a prior restraint and because the plaintiffs there were seeking an injunction. Uh, the court really focused its an, uh, analysis on the preliminary injunction factors and really ended up saying that, at least in that case, the United States government's interest in uh, preventing the, the dissemination of those files overseas really overcame any analysis here. But really, it's a quite different case here precisely because the rights to receive this information of citizens in Ames are also being violated by this law. And this court has said consistently that uh, the First Amendment protects not just the rights of, of speakers, but also of listeners. And this gets back to J Justice Carney's question about the use of the internet. We think uh, preventing the dissemination of this information over the internet really does burden uh, heavily the rights of persons in Ames who are going to put this information to lawful and valuable uses. Let, let me interrupt for just a minute. Uh, um, is it your position, following up on Justice Sotomayor's uh, question, is it your position that the fact that there is a significant functional aspect to the CAD files that are downloadable, albeit with additional expertise and action by the receiver, is it your position that has no effect on our analysis, that this is purely a content-based speech regulation and we should overlook the technological aspects of the information that's being conveyed? Your Honor, I, I think that is our submission, and for, for two important reasons, I think it would be a mistake 
to follow the Corley Court and other courts that considered speech, the courts the state, uh, the state addresses in their brief, and diminish the, the protection of this speech, exempt it from the normal uh, presumption against the constitutionality of content-based restrictions. We think that would be the case for two reasons. First, Reed made very clear that the, before we get to the government's purpose uh, in looking at whether a law is content-based or content-neutral, we first have to ask whether it is facially uh, content-based on its face or not. And we submit this law is facially content-based on its face quite clearly. It only prescribes publication of this information if it describes a certain kind of firearm. So that's clearly facially content-based. But again, regardless of its functional purpose. Yes. So, so if it were uh, a recipe to uh, create uh, some toxic drug, it's still a recipe no more than that. And I we should overlook the other aspects. And the state is misguided, then, in your view, in pointing out that um, the uh, ready availability of this recipe um, could undermine its uh, whole uh, gun regulation scheme for, in terms of tracking guns and so on. Your Honor, that I has no import at all, in your view. I think that's right, Your Honor, because I think the state's interest would be the same if it wanted to go after the publication of gunsmithing manuals in books. Uh, they would still have a fear that persons would be able to, you know, as we say in our brief, order unfinished lower receivers and all of the other necessary parts from the internet, which they can now do completely unregulated, and assemble those firearms. I think the interest would be the same. Does it matter that your client's version is not a fully functional version? that it requires some, the, the, the end user to have the right um, software to download it properly? I think it matters to the analysis of whether or not this is speech that's itself integral to criminal conduct. Uh, perhaps if this uh, firearm, if this was essentially equivalent to the distribution of the firearm itself, if there really was no difference and no distance between the act of uploading this file to the internet and, the, and then the downloader having a working firearm in their hand, perhaps we would, we would say that it is essentially well, the distribution there, of a firearm. There is a difference because doesn't Ames have a law that you have to register any firearm that you possess? Your Honor, I'm, I'm not aware of that law, if that law exists. I do not believe it does. I, I, my understanding is that in Ames, just like under federal law, if one manufactures a firearm for home use only, then it does not need to be registered or serialized. But indeed, it's, Your Honor raises an important point uh, that other states have uh, requirements just like that. As we say in our brief, at, our opening brief at page 36, the state of California has responded to the problem of potential 3D printing of firearms by requiring the serialization and registration of any firearm, plastic or not, manufactured at home. And it's our understanding, this just happened recently, that New Jersey is about to pass a law that would outlaw the 3D printing of firearms altogether. Now, it's our submission, uh, and our third argument, is that where other jurisdictions have seen that less speech restrictive alternatives are effective and work, that raises a strong presumption, as this court put it in the McCullen case, that the state has uh, foregone. Excuse me, how, how do we know that they work? Well, Your Honor, it, it raises an inference that they work because these files have been online for five years, as we say, since Cody Wilson first put his files on the internet. They've been easily findable. The states have really seen no problems, at least with uh, single shot plastic firearms. And because other jurisdictions have seen that they're able to, to achieve their interest, or at least think that they will in the last couple of years, not by going after speech, as the state of Ames has done here. So we have to wait until people are murdered? Your Honor. And can't the shooter can't be traced? And there's no way of detecting who the perpetrator is before states can take a prophylactic measure to... Uh, protect themselves? Your Honor, we don't think the state has to wait for people to be murdered. It's our submission that where we've provided many reasons why bad actors are really unlikely to use 3D printing as a way to circumvent the law, they have other means at their disposal, the state has, especially at strict scrutiny, a heavy burden to overcome to show that, in fact, that is not the case. Thank you. We ask this court reverse. You may proceed. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Catherine McCaffrey, and on behalf of Petitioner Ian Groves, I will address the Second Amendment issue. Fifteen years ago, Mr. Groves committed a nonviolent crime, which was classified by the state of Ames as a misdemeanor, and for which he received no jail time. Today, 
AIM seeks to enforce a statute that would prevent him from possessing any type of firearm for any purpose for the rest of his life. The statute is unconstitutional as applied to Mr. Groves for two reasons. First, it is a complete and permanent deprivation of his fundamental right to bear arms, and thus should be subject to per se invalidation. Second, at the very least, the state cannot justify the burden that this ban imposes. Can I back you up a moment? Sure. Um, there are only two states left, maybe just one, that ban felons from ever voting. And we've upheld those bans as the prerogative of the states. Why is it that the mere conviction of an individual is not a forfeiture or waiver of entitlement to certain constitutional rights, including this one, the possession of a firearm? What makes this any different than the fundamental right to vote? Um, we permit states to ban that fundamental right. Why shouldn't we uh, permit the government to ban the right to own a firearm? Because, Your Honor, as this court said in Heller, the scope of the Second Amendment is set by the original public understanding of the right. And so we need to look to practice at the time of the founding to understand uh, what the original public understanding of the right was. Now, the historical evidence we've, we have uncovered indicates that at the time of the founding, an individual convicted of a crime was only stripped of their firearm rights in two instances, when they were incarcerated or when they were sentenced to a crime punishable by death. In both of those instances, the individual also lost their political rights. In contrast, in cases where the individual did not lose their political rights upon conviction, they did not lose their right to bear arms. This indicates- So you're telling me that all those laws we've upheld, denying convicted felons the opportunity to vote while they're on probation, many states have that law. Um, all of the states that had lifetime voting bans, those are unconstitutional as well? Uh, no, Your Honor. We limit this. You still haven't told me why your Second Honor, Amendment is more fundamental than those other rights. It's certainly not, Your Honor. The reason we uh, conduct the Second Amendment analysis in this way is because Heller has instructed us to do so. The Second Amendment right to bear arms was the codification of a pre existing right to bear arms that existed under British common law starting in the year 1689. And so the founding generation was not developing any new right. They were merely codifying a right that already existed. That's part of why the court in Heller asked us oh, to look. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought our Constitution was creating new rights. Uh, as this court the said. The right not to quarter soldiers was not a British right. It was codified in our Constitution because our founding fathers were upset that that was happening in Britain. My apologies, Your Honor, that's certainly right. Uh, the Second Amendment right was not the creation of a new right, but the codification of a pre-existing right to bear arms. And it seems at the time of the founding, that right was limited to members of the political community. Ian Groves, as far as we know, remains a member of the political community, and that's why he retains his Second Amendment right to vote. Does your argument depend at all on the fact that a misdemeanor, uh, that this would have been a misdemeanor, and this would not have been a felony at the time of the founding, under any historical understanding of his, 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 the crime that he committed? Does, do, do you make that argument, or is that not part of your argument? So, Your Honor, that's certainly relevant, that at the time of the founding, individuals convicted of misdemeanors were not denied political rights, nor were they denied the right to possess a firearm. However, even if this court chooses not to look merely at the historical analysis, uh, we ask this court to uh, confine the scope of the Second Amendment right to the original public understanding, that's the political community, and then turn and ask today, who is a member of the political community? Ian Groves remained a member, excuse me, an individual like Ian Groves remained a member of the political community and thus retained his right to bear arms at the time of the founding, and he does so today. So under either analysis, Ian Groves retains his Second Amendment right. So does, does that mean that um, if your historical analysis is correct, that um, felons should be able to recover their arms when they're released from prison? I think you're... A brief pointed out that it was only when incarcerated um, that uh, they surrendered that right. So, Your Honor, that's certainly a more difficult question to answer. Uh, what we know is that at present, the vast majority of states limit the uh, political rights of felons uh, at at least some time. 
I think if we look at the current political landscape, uh, the best way to describe the a felon's position in the political community is contested. Uh, so that individual may regain their right to bear arms. Uh, to say so conclusively would require a little bit more historical analysis. So do we need to look at the political community definition in each of the states that Justice Sotomayor was referring to as to uh, whether who, when felons have rights to vote and when they don't? Uh, so, Your Honor, we've put forth a theory that uh, the political community is determined on a national scale because we're not talking about any specific case, excuse me, state constitution here. We're asking about the federal constitution, which is... At what point in time? You're asking us to look at the founding fathers, but should we look at it in the time of the Wild West? Should we look at it today? Should we look at it 50 years ago? How do we decide what moment that national consensus was founded? So, Your Honor, there's actually two moving parts to this analysis, if I may explain. First is where we set the rule for what is the scope of the political community. Now, uh, the court in Heller tells us that we need to look to the original public understanding of the rule. The Heller court limited its analysis through the end of the 1800s, and so we encourage the court to do the same today. Once the scope of the Second Amendment has been set, the rule has been set as the political community, we then turn to today. Today, who is a member of that political community? So we're asking this court to determine the national consensus today as to who retains political rights. Do we and have to do that? Can you win just on a straight up analysis that your as applied challenge is, is good for a misdemeanor um, and, and no one's ever made that yet? that's been held by our, heard by our court on that point. Um, can we just, do we have to do, do this um, originalist analysis in order to rule for your client? So it's true, Your Honor, that no, of, excuse me, none of the lower courts besides the Third Circuit in Bindrup has considered a case like this where the individual at issue was a misdemeanant. And in the Bindrup case, the court found that the law was unconstitutional as applied to that individual. This court does need to answer two questions. The first is whether Ian Groves has the right, and the second is whether the burden on that right is justified. So to determine who has the right, we ask this court to look to the original public understanding of the Constitution. Well, that's assuming we believe he was convicted of a misdemeanor. Generally, the definition of felon has always been someone who um, can be jailed for over a year. And under the crime he committed, he could have been jailed for more than two years far above the minimum that most uh, felons are um, announced. It's only the oddities of this state, Ames' state, um, that makes this a mis misdemeanor. Um, so why shouldn't we use the normal understanding of felons? Uh, you're you're honest... asking us to use the original understanding of who's a part of the political community, but you're not asking us to do that with respect to who's a felon? Two things, Your Honor. First, if this court was uh, operating under what was the definition of a felony or misdemeanor at the time of the founding, Ian Groves' crime, forgery, was considered to be a misdemeanor at the time of the founding. Now, the reason that it's important to note that Ian Groves is a misdemeanant is because when it comes to political rights, the line between felons and misdemeanants is actually pretty clear. Now, the vast majority of states only limit political rights for felons. And in the states that do have misdemeanors punishable by more than one year, that includes Ames, but it also includes states like South Carolina and Pennsylvania, in those states, the states only limit political rights for individuals classified as felons. What this tells us is that the classification of the offense is dispositive when it comes to political rights. If I could ask, in your uh, briefs, you describe Mr. Groves as a never incarcerated, nonviolent misdemeanant. Our conversation um, right now has been focusing on whether he's a misdemeanant or a felon. But I wondered whether how the other two aspects of his prior convictions uh, play into the rule that you would propose. This is an as-applied challenge, and um, you, know, you have a, a, a persuasive argument that he poses very little risk. But I wondered, you know, we have struggled in defining what is a violent crime or a nonviolent crime. What might be just looking at elements is purse snatching, for example, a violent right. crime that would disqualify someone. And I wonder what rule you would propose that we be adopting if we were to um, uh, take your general position with regard to um, Mr. Groves. 
Sure, Your Honor. So first, just to clarify, uh, the reason that we uh, discuss the relative dangerousness of the category of individuals never incarcerated nonviolent misdemeanants is because we didn't want to focus our analysis uh, specifically on Mr. Groves, because we didn't want to convey to this court that we were asking for perfect tailoring. That's concededly not the analysis here. Uh, the state must only show narrow tailoring. However, we put forth that because uh, never incarcerated nonviolent misdemeanants as a class pose no heightened risk of gun violence, or they certainly don't pose a heightened risk for life, that shows that this law is not just slightly overbroad, but that it's dramatically overbroad. But I'm it's sorry, oh, please go what ahead. difference does it make whether it's a felon violent or non-violent in your theory of this case? Your theory of the case is we go back to original intent, and you tell us that back then, the only people who were deprived of a gun were felons in jail or people who were subject to capital death. So is your theory founded on him being a nonviolent miscreant? I, I don't quite understand. What's the purpose? Where are you asking us to draw the line? Sure, Your Honor. So uh, this analysis involves uh, two separate questions. The first is whether the individual possesses a right to bear arms. That depends on if they're a member of the political community, and so there is where the classification as misdemeanor or felon is dispositive. Now, when we get to the second step of the analysis, So you think scrutiny, true felons of any kind are not part of the political community? Uh, they may not be, Your Honor. Uh, as I was discussing with Justice Carney, uh, that question is a little bit more difficult to answer because the vast majority of states, 48 to be exact, uh, strip political rights from felons, though many do give these political rights back. So it's a little bit more difficult of a question to answer than in the case of an individual classified as a misdemeanor. The vast majority of states do not strip any political rights from these individuals. But there's two questions before this court, and I'd like to make that clear. The first is a historical question, which answers whether Ian Groves has a Second Amendment right. But the second is the question of whether the burden imposed by that right is justified. Now, to begin, because this uh, law is a permanent deprivation of the right to bear arms, we argue that it should be held to be per se unconstitutional. But even if this court were to proceed through a scrutiny analysis, the law still can't pass scrutiny because the state has failed to put forth sufficient evidence to indicate that this, that, excuse me, that depriving an individual like Ian Groves is necessary in any way to prevent gun violence. Now, the state relies on two studies to come to its conclusion, but we urge this court not to rely on those two studies too heavily. That's because these studies focus their analysis mainly on prisoners within the first few years of their convictions. But in contrast, Ian Groves was never sentenced to incarceration, and his crime was over 15 years ago, so those groups are just too different. And even if in the abstract it were reasonable for the court to come to, the, excuse me, for the state to come to the conclusion that it did, in light of the evidence that we've put forth that suggests an individual like Ian Groves never poses an increase, excuse me, never poses an increased risk of violence, or certainly doesn't after a term of seven to ten years, we argue that the state's conclusion is just not a reasonable conclusion drawn from sufficient evidence. So what's evidence. a reasonable time limit to bar him, under your theory? Should Here you make a great deal of the fact that it was a nonviolent conviction and he has not been a recidivist for 15 years. So is five enough? Is 10 enough? Is what's enough? So based on the uh, consensus of recent social science, it, it seems to be that after a period of 10 years, the relative risk of an offender, a nonviolent offender, decreases to the point that it meets the relative risk of a non-offender, and essentially the individual poses no risk at all. Now this is, uh, this is also, uh, we can also find support for this in the practices of the U.S. Sentencing Commission, which hold that after 10 years, an individual's prior conviction should not be considered in calculating a criminal history. So no. are you asking us to, to use a 10-year period to bar misdemeanors, people who commit misdemeanors? from having firearms? Is that, your, is that what you're advocating here today? Uh, at the very least, Your Honor. We also put forth evidence. I thought you said it was per se unconstitutional. Uh, yes, Your Honor. So which is it? Uh, Your Honor, a lifetime permanent and complete deprivation of the fundamental right to bear arms is per se unconstitutional. A firearms restriction that is limited in time or limited in scope in some way may be constitutional if the state can show that it is justified. Now, it's our contention that an individual like Ian Groves never posed a heightened risk of gun violence. And what so, level of showing does the state have to make? 
So, Your Honor, that depends on the level of scrutiny that this court chooses to analyze this law under. If we get to strict, if we're strict scrutiny because we're out of per se, then what level of showing? So what the state needs to show is that it was a reasonable inference based on substantial evidence. The problem with the state's evidence is that there's simply not enough for there to be, under any definition of the term, substantial evidence to indicate an individual like Ian Groves poses a heightened risk. That's why the state can't succeed under either strict or intermediate scrutiny. But now, I like it's not that people who have not been recidivists for 15 years, that all of them fail to commit a crime. It's just that the numbers are small. So why should we upset the state's judgment that even a small number of potential recidivists is enough to justify a lifetime ban? Because, Your Honor, the Second Amendment right to bear arms, as this court has said, is a fundamental right. And, and no amount of justification put forth by the state uh, can justify the total stripping of that fundamental right. That's why we ask that this court reverse. Thank you. Respondents? Thank you, Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Marlon Golden, and I represent the state of Ames. I will show that the Ames Felon in Possession Law does not offend the Second Amendment, and my co-counsel, Nick Akar, will show that the 3D-printed Gun Violence Prevention Act does not violate the First Amendment. We ask the court to affirm on both counts. The right to bear arms does not extend to persons our society has long thought too dangerous to carry lethal weapons. When he committed his crimes, Petitioner forfeited the Second Amendment guarantee. And even if the Second Amendment protects a right to bear arms that the petitioner enjoys, he has not shown that the law is unconstitutional as applied to him. At the founding, would he have been found too dangerous? We believe so, Justice Elrod. Under what theory? He would be considered an unvirtuous citizen at the founding, Your Honor, because he would have committed crimes that represent uh, severe maladjustment and disrespect for the law. Forgery would have been considered uh, would have stripped him is under the founding. You have some authority for that? Justice, uh, Justice Elrod, that's correct. We believe that uh, the founding level sources show uh, that the number of felonies, even before uh, the felonies had made their way uh, from English common law to the United States, had already ballooned. Um, so we have information that shows that uh, even Blackstone and his commentaries on the law of England said that there were at least 160 felonies at that time. We believe. Well, I think thought your adversary said that um, forgery was a misdemeanor at the founding. Well, Chief Justice Sotomayor, even if that were so, that does not resolve this case. The traditional definition of a felony is someone who is punishable by a year imprisonment uh, or more. And if we look to the traditional- Was that the understanding at the founding? She's arguing founding. What are you arguing? We argue that, we argue that the traditional restrictions on felons, that is, those who are punishable by at least a year in prison, uh, or what justifies. Traditional since when? Uh, well, we believe at least as traditional as this court noted in Heller. So in Heller, this court said that long-standing prohibitions, not founding era prohibitions. So you're talking about the 1930s? Is that what you're talking about? At, at least dating back to the interwar period, Justice Elrod, but we believe history is instructive here as well. For example, the Pennsylvania Minority Report, uh, the dissent of the minority at this Pennsylvania State Ratification Convention, showed that the right to bear arms could be restricted for crimes committed or for risk of public in injury. And we believe that understanding is what's informative here today. So it's true that the authors well, of that- that's one state. What other documents can you point to to well, show us how other states responded? Chief Justice Sotomayor, that was one state. It was shared, however, by the uh, drafters in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. All of those states were penned by anti-federalists who eventually won out with the ratification of the Bill of Rights itself. So it's their understanding of the Second Amendment that the right is not unlimited that Heller identified. It said that the scope of the right uh, did not extend to those long-standing prohibitions that were understood uh, to be outside the scope of the right entirely. Now, Heller tells us that these are exceptions to the Second Amendment right. Well, Heller, Heller acknowledges a presumption but doesn't really articulate it in any great length um, as for felonies and for 
um, uh, people with mental illness and acknowledges that the list is not exhaustive. But it also recognizes a fundamental right to bear arms, which hadn't been articulated in that way before. And I wonder how the state can uh, justify under intermediate scrutiny, say, um, a uh, lifetime ban um, where the right is seen as necessary to, uh, uh, for people to defend themselves. Um, why should someone who has been convicted of such a, uh, an offense as this that didn't even merit jail time um, be uh, deprived of the right to defend his family? Well, Justice Carney, I'll, I'll take your question about the uh, presumptively lawful and the scope of the right first, which is uh, if you read the opinion that the Heller delivered, the court in Heller delivered in its entirety, it showed that everything hinged on the fact that the petitioner in that case, Dick Heller, uh, was not disqualified from the exercise of Second Amendment rights in the first place. The court also grouped this discussion of the longstanding prohibitions alongside its decision in United States versus Miller. Uh, and that dates back to the 1930s where it said that sawed off shotguns uh, were presumptively categorically outside the Second Amendment right. And so even if uh, we believe that the presumptively lawful language refers to a rebuttable presumption, which of course the state contests, uh, we believe that the burden that the the petitioner in this case would have to show is that he is in some meaningful way different from the historically barred class, and he has failed to carry that burden. Well, now, let, let me follow up in just a second. You said presumptively lawful, uh, lawful doesn't mean that it's a rebuttable presumption. I mean, the state can take whatever measures it wants um, with regard to felons and denying them a right, and there, there's no examination that is appropriate. Justice Carney, that's correct. When a felon commits his crimes and is punishable by a sentence of up to five years in prison in this case. He has forfeited his rights to guarantee his right to bear arms, to vote, to serve on a jury, to seek public office. This court has noted as much in its decisions such as Richardson versus Ramirez, and we do not believe that the Second Amendment right stands in any way in contrast to those rights, which uh, as a matter of legislative grace, the states do often permit as the petitioner in this case argues, but that is not the same as a constitutional requirement. Counsel, so, so what do you do with the cases that we have that deal with um, uh, people, sexual predators, for example, and they're barred for a time period from their computers, but there have been cases discussing that they cannot be barred forever from having access to a computer. Um, why, why is that situation different? Well, Justice Elrod, I would first note that Again, we believe that felons categorically forfeit their right to bear arms so long as they remain a felon. So Heller referred to felons and the mentally ill uh, in the present tense. And this tells us something important, which is that so long as someone remains a felon, uh, the state has not violated any constitutional right when it withholds from him the right to possess a firearm. Now, when that status changes, uh, if a state continue to bar someone from continuing to own a firearm, uh, we believe that we might have a closer case. What, what if you're I'm wrong? sorry, I'm, I'm a little confused. How do you not become a felon? Um, are you taking their position that, well, you're under a criminal sentence, you're a felon, but once you leave a federal sentence, you no longer are? This man served his time on probation, and he's been incident-free for 15 years. I'm not quite sure what you mean, stop being a felon. Certainly, she Justice Sotomayor, what we mean is that someone would have to have either their rights restored, the record expunged, or would have to receive a pardon. And the statute that Ames has adopted, of course, represents federal law, provides that someone, even with those conditions, might have as an explicit restriction imposed upon them, upon expungement or pardon, that they still are not able to possess a firearm. And when we you say rights restored, that's civil rights restored? We believe that's probably what that means, yes. And so um, are you taking the position that the uh, petitioner in this case didn't have his rights restored? Well, the record his is... His civil rights restored? The record is silent on that, Chief Justice Sotomayor, but uh, we, if we, even if we assume that his rights uh, have been restored in this case, uh, the political community argument the petitioner has identified simply does not resolve felon in possession challenges. If it did, uh, it would mean that states uh, that allow currently incarcerated persons to vote, such as Maine and Vermont, would stand in violation of the Second Amendment when they prevented that person from 
exercising a right to bear arms. Counsel, so, if you're wrong about the, that it's a felony and that it's truly a misdemeanor, assume arguendo it's a misdemeanor, do you, can you still win? We can, Justice Elrod. Uh, can now, you, okay, can you give any example where a misdemeanor violation suspends a constitutional right forever? Well, Justice Elrod, I would believe this is a situation analogous to the Sixth Amendment context. So the court has said in Lewis that certain misdemeanors are serious enough to trigger the jury trial right. Other misdemeanors are mere petty offenses. It has chosen an objective indicator of seriousness in those cases, and it has looked to the maximum punishable sentence. We ask the court to follow a similar path here. Certain misdemeanor crimes are so grave that they are functionally felonies. And the states have long understood that they do not offend the Second Amendment when they prevent people who have committed those crimes from owning a gun, because they are more likely to abuse a firearm as a fact of their criminal record. Now, this accords with long-standing understandings of uh, what state legislatures and what Congress uh, can do in analyzing the types of people who are more likely to commit gun violence in the future. The court said in Heller that certain policy choices were taken off the table. It also said at the conclusion of its opinion that this did not leave the states powerless to combat the problem of gun violence in this country. And so felon in possession laws, like the one that Ames has enacted, is valid policy choice exercised by the states in all of its applications. But you're, so you're using it as a, using fe, uh, the status of, of a felon as a proxy for dangerousness, and yet not taking into account the lapse of time, the nonviolent nature of the offense, the fact that no time was served and, or no, and no time was included in the sentence. It seems like a very imperfect um, match. Um, can, is, doesn't the state have an obligation in light of the uh, fundamental, fun, fundamental nature of the right to do better tailoring? Well, Justice Carney, I have, I have two answers there. First is that uh, the unvirtuous citizen rationale that has long animated uh, gun safety laws uh, is not limited to a showing of future dangerousness. Now, if it were so, the statute in this case, 922G, would not include people like those who have renounced their citizenship, for example. So second, if we assume, however, that the showing of future dangerousness is what justifies uh, Ames' felon in possession law and nothing else, then the state can succeed if it burdens a right the petitioner enjoys under intermediate scrutiny. But aren't you using the status of being a felon as a proxy for dangerousness? I thought that's what I was just hearing you argue. We, we do believe that there is significant correlation there, uh, Justice Carney. Uh, we believe that the legislatures do not err when they believe that those who have committed crimes in the past and have a track record for violating the law are more likely to violate uh, the law in the future and do so in a way that offends uh, public safety and community security. And as so, a, as applied to Mr. Groves, who committed a misdemeanor of forging a uh, an ID 17 years ago and has been law-abiding since then, I think your adversary would say that doesn't uh, predict violence of any type. How, how can you contest that? Well, we, we disagree there, Your Honor, and the reason that we disagree is because uh, the court would have to require a more exacting standard in order to stri strike down the state's law. It does not need to show that, as applied to an individual person who is a state law misdemeanor, uh, that the law passes intermediate scrutiny. Rather, it only needs to show that the law is valid as applied to that class of persons that the state reasonably believes pose a future increased risk of harm to others. Is it only to gun regulation of felons that we apply intermediate scrutiny? Or is it your position that all regulation of firearms is subject to strict scrutiny? Chief Justice Sotomayor, uh, of course, there are uh, only a handful of, of cases dealing with the Second Amendment explicitly at the Supreme Court. Now, the courts of appeals have applied intermediate scrutiny to any number of restrictions on the right to bear arms. Uh, we only, however, proceed to strict scrutiny if the right uh, that is restricted by the law uh, is at the core of the Second Amendment right. Now, felons as a class uh, can never sit at the core of the Second Amendment right because they have forfeited the right to bear arms entirely. Now, second, uh, even if we assume that presumptively lawful means that we have a rebuttable presumption here, that language in the court's opinion in Heller must be given some weight, and it can't be squared with strict scrutiny. 
But rebuttable usually means something can act to rebut it. So what, in your judgment, would that be? Well, Chief Justice Sotomayor, the rebuttable presumption, if as-applied challenges are allowed, would come in those close cases where we're unsure whether someone can validly still be considered a felon. Uh, so, for example, in the only circuit court of appeals to ever uphold an as-applied challenge to an individual felon, uh, the person and the, the challengers in that case had already see, received relief under state law in state court, but nevertheless was still subject to the federal prohibition. So we can imagine the opposite being true as well. Uh, now, we can also imagine cases where uh, someone has received uh, their civil rights restored or received a pardon, had their record expunged by a court, but nevertheless, under the statute, is still prohibited from owning a firearm. And while we still believe that law likely could pass scrutiny, we believe that would be a closer case, and that would be the kind of as-applied challenge the court would accept, because it would be answering a key question. Is this person still a felon? In this case, there's no doubt. Petitioner status has not changed. And if and until that changes, the state of Ames does not stand in violation of the Second Amendment in enforcing its felon in possession law against him. Now, at Council, some have some have criticized um, this approach that you're discussing, this intermediate approach, as treating the Second Amendment as a second-class right. Um, would you agree that a publisher who was convicted of a misdemeanor uh, could not have his publication rights suspended for the rest of his life? Justice Elrod, we have, we have two answers there. First is that uh, we don't advise intermediate scrutiny. Uh, I'm not it, the first person to ask that question, so <laughs> go ahead. Certainly. Uh, we, we, we don't believe intermediate scrutiny is necessary here. We believe that text, history, and tradition of the Second Amendment definitively resolve this question. Felons categorically lie outside the scope of the Second Amendment. Now, to answer your question about the publisher and the First Amendment question, I, I would need to say that the rights proceed from different historical rationales. So whereas someone who uh, is prohibited from engaging in the marketplace of ideas uh, has had a disability worked upon him to engage in the fundamental right of freedom of expression, uh, someone who is violated uh, by a statute that prohibits someone when he belongs to a class that is shown to be more dangerous, uh, that is a simple exercise of the state police power. It is justified not as a punitive measure against him, but by an exercise of the state's uh, ability to protect public safety. So you're saying we are supposed to treat the first and second differently? Is that what you're saying? Just, Justice Elrod, we believe that the Second Amendment guarantee is just as fundamental as the first. We only say that different purposes animate a felon in possession law uh, as opposed to those that but would... But the hypo was a misdemeanor. Even a state law misdemeanor uh, that might be subject to a traditional felon in possession law uh, because of the virtue of the number of years that he can be uh, placed uh, in a term of years in prison. So if we understand that the longstanding tradition of felon in possession laws that this court said uh, was lawful in Heller uh, remains just as lawful today, the only reason that the court could find for the petitioner is if he was able to distinguish himself from the mine run of cases that challenge felon in possession laws in this country year in and year out. And that is a burden the petitioner has failed to carry in this case. Even Why if, has he failed to carry that? that? I mean, this seems like one of the best typos you could make on that. Uh, what's he missing? Justice Elrod, what's missing is a change in his status as a felon. Other than him not being convicted, his, that, that's the only thing missing. And, and we believe that that is the key thing that is absent from this case, Justice Elrod. Uh, if there are no further questions, uh, we ask the court to affirm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Nick Akar, and today I will argue that the Ames 3D printed Gun Violence Prevention Act is constitutional. Your Honors, today technology enables individuals to 3D print guns in the comfort of their own home. Publishing these files offers individuals a new form of gun distribution that circumvents both state and federal gun safety we laws. We don't permit the banning of books that teach people how to make bombs. 
the books don't provide the raw materials, they don't provide the instruments to make the bombs. So they're not much different in my mind than diagrams. So why is the fact that a CAD diagram capable of being put into effect by someone else any different than a bomb making book? Your Honor, we would argue that these 3D printable gun files, those regulated by the GVPA, the Gun Violence Prevention Act in Ames, are not simple blueprints. Uh, they're not the blueprint that tells an individual how to make a gun. They're the blueprint that actually makes the gun. This is a form of technology that this court, or any court for that matter, has ever countenanced. It's a technology that can build an object. And it's in that way, it's important to understand exactly what the GVPA regulates. You see, the Act's plain language limits its scope to a subset of CAD files or computer code, those that can automatically print an operational gun. In other words, Your Honors, the GVPA does not regulate uh, firearm design files or CAD files that simply depict virtual guns. It only applies to those that can automatically create and produce an operational firearm, those that already well, have instructions. Well, that sounds nice, but as I understand it, um, it can't, you just don't take a CAD script, put it into the computer, and the gun comes out of the computer. Um, as I understand it, you have to uh, adjust the program to a particular printer. You have to change the printing mechanism to do the slices. And then you have to provide the raw materials and all sorts of other steps have to be taken before the gun produces. It doesn't come out of the CAD wholesale. Your Honor, we would disagree with that description of the technology. Uh, it is true that individuals might have to put the puzzle pieces of the gun together or purchase the raw materials, but it is not true that CAD files with ready instructions encoded within them can be published on the internet. Those files are available. And in fact, a domestic abuser in Ames just two years ago downloaded one of these files. And there's no evidence in the record to suggest that there was any slicing needed. And in fact... Well, he only, as I understood it, uh, used a CAD part in a completed gun. He didn't use the whole gun. Certainly, Your Honor. Uh, it is possible for these CAD files to print parts. But the contention here, uh, as Chief Justice Sotomayor, you mentioned, is that the files uh, require a number of steps. And we would disagree with that contention. While they do require some steps, there are CAD files that, unlike firearm design files, which do not have instructions to a 3D printer, there are files that do have instructions to a 3D printer and would enable a young child or a domestic user or a felon to very easily print their very own gun in the comfort of their own home. But still, isn't this a content-based restriction? This is saying you cannot publish to the internet, upload files that provide information that can be uh, accessed and read and understood by a user, albeit with a functional aspect to it, but um, we don't like content-based restrictions generally. You have to satisfy strict scrutiny. And you know, the record suggested that um, such files and uh, alternative pro CAD programs and related programs have been available for quite a while, um, that uh, AIMS is the only jurisdiction that is banning their uploading to the internet. Um, and th why, I need you to explain to me why the state has a compelling interest that is narrowly tailored in restricting the transfer of this information in the way that the statute does? Certainly, Your Honor. Uh, I'll address the first part of your question, uh, noting that this might be a content-based regulation, and we would reject that contention. Uh, under Reed, a content-based regulation is content-based if it regulates based off of the idea or the message expressed. And that's not what the GVPA does here. The GVPA regulates yes, based... Yes, it says don't, pr don't uh, upload a diagram of a gun. How is that not an idea. Well, Your Honor, under the plain text of the statute, the statute does not say that an individual cannot upload a diagram of the gun, of a gun. It simply indicates that an individual cannot upload onto the internet, available to the public, a diagram of a gun that can automatically produce a firearm, a diagram that has instructions that would enable somebody to automatically print a firearm. That functional component is vitally important to the narrow tailoring of the GVPA to Justice Carney, Justice Carney, to your point. 
Um, and in that way, it's important also to recognize that uh, in contradiction of petitioner's statement, uh, Ames is not the only state to have uh, prohibited the publishing of these files. Uh, New Jersey recently prohibited the publishing of these uh, 3D printable gun files. And for that matter, over the past uh, five years, the publishing of these files has actually been illegal under a nationwide injunction presented in the defense distributed cases that has only become illegal in August. Furthermore, uh, since those files have been allowed to be uploaded legally at, after the Trump administration has allowed for them to be uploaded, uh, over 20 states, including California, Washington, North Carolina, and a number, of, a number of others, who understand that the uploading of these 3D printable gun files poses a threat to both public safety and gun... Wait, I, I need to interrupt. Are, are you agreeing, though, that we have a content-based restriction on speech? Uh, no, Your Honor, we're and, not. And why not? Uh, we don't believe this is a content-based restriction because it, it uh, regulates based off of the functionality of the file. But, but, but what the statute says is you may not publish over the Internet digital instructions in the form of CAD files or other computer code. Code is communication. Files are communication. Digital instructions are communication. And it's a particular kind of instruction or communication that is regulated here. I don't understand why that isn't a content-based restriction as to which we apply strict scrutiny. Well, Your Honor, in the first instance, we'd argue that this speech, if it is to be categorized as speech by this court, should actually be unprotected by the First Amendment because it is integral to criminal conduct under this court's jurisprudence in Gibney. And thus, the content-based inquiry need not even come up. I'm sorry, what's integral? There is no unless there's a law in Ames that you can't possess a firearm in your home, what's illegal about having a CAD-created gun in your home? Your Honor, under Section 922D of the Federal Firearms Statute, uh, there's a restriction on the indiscriminate distribution of guns uh, to individuals who cannot legally own them. There's also res uh, a restriction on... But that's on not... That's certain... Convicted felons can't own them. Yes, sir. But Your Honor. a normal, unconvicted person, myself sitting in my home, can I own a gun? Uh, yes, Your Honor. I would presume. So if I were to take this CAD program and create a gun other than this law, would I be breaking any other law? Uh, you would not, Your Honor, and we believe that the GVP... So why is this an instrumentality of a crime, of criminal conduct? It's the person who uses it illegally who's committing the crime. It's not the program committing the crime. Well, Your Honor, we believe the Internet is important to distinguish here because on the Internet there are approximately, by our calculations, about one in every four persons are prohibited from owning a firearm on uh, those who have access to the Internet. And under federal firearms regulations... Uh, we have one out of four internet users are convicted felons? Uh, no, Your Honor, but children are also prohibited from owning handguns, those handguns that a uh, petitioner wishes to put freely on, online. And we would argue sorry, that... What's the, what's the source of that statement? Uh, Your Honor, according to recent census data, there are about 75 to 80 million children in the U.S. who have internet access, and there are a number of uh, about 5 to 6 uh, million felons, and that's not even counting uh, those uh, citizen, excuse non-citizens who are here in the United States who cannot own a gun. So your and argument is that because there are people who are not allowed, we'll just call them bad people or people who are too young, can't have this, that the, the lawful people should be deprived access? Why isn't that just quintessential overbreath? Your Honor, we don't think that the lawful individuals who can own this gun are, are, uh, are deprived of access. Uh, the GVPA, we'd argue, does not, is not a total ban on 3D printable gun files. It allows for private communications and, as Justice Elrod, you noted, it even allows for a website to be posted and information to be disseminated uh, to let people know that if they want these files, they can distribute them privately, but not publicly in an area where children and felons can download these files uh, at a whim if they want to and possess a 3D printable gun. What's so why isn't it that you didn't regulate that activity? Why a total ban rather than one that says, if you're going to share a file, you have to have that person identify themselves? 
Uh, Your Honor, we think in the context of gun regulations, it's important to have both preventative and remedial measures. Uh, this court, uh, in the federal, federal firearm regulations, have recognized this, not only banning the distribution uh, of guns generally, and also not simply requiring uh, registration of firearms after they're given to, from a federal firearm dealer to an individual, but they put in place a federal background check. Uh, the GVPA acts like that federal background check in that it is a preventative but measure. But this is speech. So it, you can't be, you can't chill pro- protected speech. You have, to, you have to tailor. Well, Your Honor, we do believe that this is narrowly tailored in that it does not touch all firearm design files. It had, touches a specific subset. And if this court were to grant full speech protection and thus reject the integral to criminal conduct argument that we submit, we believe that it would, it's important for the doctrine, uh, the First Amendment doctrine that this court has proffered in Reed, uh, that that doctrine uh, be adapted to deal with the intricacies of this new technology. The Most- problem I have is that although you're talking to me about various needs of the state, the law as written isn't even satisfying one of those needs because is your adversary correct? that someone can put this CAD on a website or, or offer it, and as long as someone privately emails them for it, they can share it? Uh, we do believe that would be allowed under the GVPA, Your Honor. So if it allows that, what is the ban accomplishing? Your Honor, the ban is accomplishing something that occurred in Ames just two years ago and other, uh, ac- other instances where individuals Uh, who would like to have these files at a moment's notice can get them. It also disables the... All that gentleman would have had to do was to write to the petitioner and ask him for a copy of the CAD, and that would have been perfectly legal. Your Honor, we think the delay here is important. In the context of gun laws, uh, the narrow tailoring is sufficient here because it doesn't burden substantially more speech than is necessary. For example, the GVPA could have been written to cover those files without instructions to a 3D printer. But the Ames legislature decided to narrowly tailor the statute so that it wouldn't confront the issues posed by the First Amendment doctrine. But we do argue that the First Amendment doctrine needs to be changed in the context of this new type of speech if this court were to grant speech protection to 3D printable gun files. So you're saying you can delay, what, for 48 hours, for 72, you can delay speech rights for certain time periods? We don't allow the delay of of First Amendment rights for time periods or other fundamental rights, uh, except under very limited circumstances. Certainly, Your Honor. This court made that point clear in Bartnicki, stated that there are some rare occasions in which a law suppressing one party's speech may be justified by an interest in deterring criminal conduct by another. And we think in the context where a file, like the 3D printable gun file issue here, can automatically produce a firearm, that is the rare scenario that we have here. And for that reason, we urge this court to do what it did uh, in Denver and in Carpenter and adjust its precedent in the face of technology that we've never seen before. In Carpenter, this court stated firmly that when confronting new concerns wrought by digital technology, this court has strayed away from uncritically applying its prior precedent. And for that reason, we urge this court to understand that this speech, if it is to be categorized speech, is entirely different from any type of speech that this court has seen before. But if this court were to move on and not adapt its precedent in applying intermediate scrutiny to 3D printable gun files that are based on the functionality of the file rather than the idea or message expressed, we do think that... Let me interrupt for just a minute, please. Um, In in, uh, assessing whether you've shown a... Uh, that this law is necessary, given the First Amendment concerns that um, my colleagues have have raised. Um, I I was struck by the points made by your adversary about the easy availability of 80% um, guns that can be assembled, that are basically sold in a modular fashion, and that can be um, uh, put together. Um, They wouldn't escape metal detectors, I suppose, to that extent. They would be somewhat less worrisome, but um, are, are readily available uh, to circumvent uh, the state of Ames registration system altogether. Do we need to take that ready, avail- ready availability into account in assessing the, whether you've shown that this is um, uh, a necessary regulation in your overall gun control uh, approach? 
I don't believe so, Justice Carney. Uh, although there might be one loophole in Ames's regulatory scheme, that does not permit the allowance of another loophole. Uh, the GVPA was enacted to close one loophole, and the Ames legislature, much like the New Jersey legislature, can, if it wants, uh, close the 80% receiver loophole. But, but, this, but this loophole has uh, First Amendment implications, whereas the other one doesn't, and that's why I'm asking whether there can be a closer tailoring um, there certainly would be required, if this court were to categorize uh, 3D printable gun files as speech, a need for closer, closer tailoring. And we do believe that the GVPA meets that need because it is unlike statutes that this court has recently struck down as unconstitutional under both intermediate and strict scrutiny. Uh, for example, in Packingham, this court noted that the statute there was vague because it left uh, sex offenders and those subject to the statute uh, in uh, purgatory, not knowing whether they could access sites like Amazon or Facebook. Here, the statute is clear. It cabins its language, its plain text, to specific files, those with instructions that can automatically print a firearm. It also allows for alternative methods of communication uh, through email, private messaging, and others that we Do you lose if we think this is content-based? Uh, no, Your Honor. Speech restriction? Uh, no, Your Honor. We do not So believe assume it is content-based. How do you meet strict scrutiny? Well, Your Honor, in the first instance, if this is facially content-based, we believe the secondary effects doctrine can be used in order to send this uh, regulation to We've never scrutiny. used that doctrine outside of adult businesses. Uh, and, and I'm not quite sure I understand how we would apply it to this situation, that there's a portion of the population that might illegally use this gun there's still a portion that won't. Certainly, So yeah. in the se secondary effects content, there's the existence of secondary effects that actually insist, exist, that justify a state regulation. But why would that doctrine apply here? I see my time has expired. If Your Honor would allow, I will answer as quickly as possible. Uh, we believe the secondary effects doctrine is applicable here, although it's only been uh, it's only been used to uphold a statute in the adult business context. It has not been cabined to that area. This court has analyzed secondary effects under RAV uh, and Booth v. Berry, and it is exactly uh, necessary here because the GVPA is justified by crime prevention, a secondary effects uh, uh, aimed at secondary effects like crime prevention. Uh, Your Honor, for these reasons, we would urge that this court affirm the lower court ruling. Thank you. Petitioners. <laughs> you have three minutes of rebuttal. Are you addressing both issues or just your issue? Yes, Your Honor, I have one point on each issue. Uh, I'd like to begin with the Second Amendment issue. Uh, again, before this court, the, the state does not really make an argument for why the law, the restriction on Groves' right to bear arms, would pass strict scrutiny. And to get into intermediate scrutiny, they rely on this notion that Heller split the Second Amendment right into a core and a non-core. But I would like to read a, a brief bit of that part of Heller at page 60, 635 of that opinion. It said that the Second Amendment is the very product of an interest balancing by the people, and whatever else it leaves to future evaluation, it surely evaluates above all, uh, sorry, pardon me, it surely elevates above all other interests the right of law-abiding responsible citizens to use arms in defense of hearth and home. And the state reads this to create a sort of tier or tranche system. Who, anybody who's not a law-abiding responsible citizen doesn't have the full Second Amendment right. But in context, it's clear Justice Scalia, Justice Scalia was simply responding to Justice Breyer on the question of whether the interest of persons like Heller could be elevated over the state's constitutional interests. So that says nothing about whether others' interests uh, are similarly uh, diminished, uh, as the state says that it should be here. And I indeed, think your adversary um, is making a slightly different, more nuanced argument. His argument is not that there's a tier in constitutional rights, but that the source of the state's power comes from a different source, and that the source of prohibiting felons from possessing firearms comes from the police source. The First Amendment, on the other hand, is not a part of the policing power. It's part of the marketplace of ideas to which even felons participate because they contribute. And so if you view it that way, 
how does — what remains of your two-tier argument? Your Honor, uh, I, I think I would disagree that the state's argument as to the tiering portion really looks to that felon, non-felon distinction. But in either event, both the state's reading of Heller and the theory you've articulated uh, runs afoul of the, the principle this court articulated in McDonald, that the Second Amendment is a fundamental right and it should not be treated, cannot be treated indeed, as a second-class right. Turning to the First Amendment point with my remaining time, the state again today, as it did in its papers, relies on a narrowing construction of this statute. Indeed, it does not defend the constitutionality of the law beyond that interpretation. And we think that interpretation presents its own constitutional concerns. Uh, namely, it would be a real chilling concern. The state would read its statute to regulate just some computer-aided design files, even though its text plainly criminalizes and imposes a five-year jail sentence on the publication of computer-aided design files. The regulated community here, as we submit in our reply brief, understands that phrase to be the kind of files that do need alteration before a 3D printer can understand them. And therefore, even the state's narrowing construction raises constitutional concerns of its own. And for these reasons, we ask that the court reverse. Thank you. We will retire to deliberate. Please have a seat. Well, before we announce the winners, and I don't know what the normal protocol is, the three of us want to make a few statements. So we figured after we announce who won, um, the rest of you wouldn't be interested in sticking around. <laughs> so we'll take advantage. Judge El. Well, the last time I was at Ames Finals was 1991, before some of you were born, I guess. But, uh, and this was a bad night for me because we lost. It was a good night in many, many respects, and I learned a lot, but we did not win. But interestingly enough, we had three judges on our panel. We had Justice Souter. We had uh, Judge Taha. And we had Judge Patrick Higginbotham from the Fifth Circuit. And the reason I tell you this is that it was a two to one split decision and Judge Patrick Higginbotham wanted it to be known that he had voted for our team. <laughs> and which was, which was, I was happy about that. But what I was really happy was that in 2007, I was named to succeed Judge Patrick Higginbotham on the Fifth Circuit. So, I t and I get to work with him still now all the time because he's a very active judge on our court. Uh, but I tell you that, so if you lose tonight, you could replace one of us. And, and so. <laughs> And I, and I hope you do, and I hope you do well. I want to thank you. This, you, 
You could all do this for a living. You should know that and be proud of the work that your team has done. The briefing and the argument, superb. The problem is a superb, timely prob problem. It is certainly not moot in the first sense of the definition. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I want to also express appreciation to the members of the BSA who worked tirelessly, and Yvonne Smith, who was working here back when I was here and has served our, this school for 40 years. So thank you. Well, I did not argue here, but I was intimidated by this room. <laughs> and it's nice to be sitting on the bench as opposed to there. <laughs> um, it, it, this has been so much fun. The problem was really wonderfully crafted. It had so many interesting issues and really challenging issues for both sides. I loved reading your briefs and hearing you tonight. You were so poised and um, ready to parry with us whatever we threw your way. You didn't lose a beat. You um, responded. You didn't lean on the bench and roll your eyes at a dumb question. You just were patient. And um, you all did really a fantastic job. And it was really just a pleasure to um, be here um, questioning you and hearing the, uh, the fruits of your very hard work over time. Um, Harvard Law School is doing a good job. And you're doing a really good job. So congratulations to you. It's hard enough to do these arguments when they're real, when they're not moot courts. So you might wonder, why do we do them? And we can tell you that we're altruistic, that we want to help our alma maters and help students. I admit the truth. Every time I come to one of these and I see the extraordinary performances of the students at these exercises, it fills me with hope about the future. It shows me that you are being trained to think and to respond in extraordinarily lawyerly, professional ways, and that you carry in your hands our future in a really good way. So I come here for you to give me hope. And so it's selfish of me. Um, I really was incredibly impressed with each and every one of you. You were prepared. You knew your case. You didn't let us rattle you. Um, you had thought through your strategy of presentation. You stuck to it. You did everything we want a well-prepared lawyer to do. Thank you. The hardest part of this exercise for us is the judging. Because it's always so close, it's usually a hair apart between the two teams, just like tonight. And we end up voting on little things that most people in the audience would really rightly call insignificant. But when you have two such evenly matched teams, you got to break the tie somehow. And so we found little things to break it on. But I do want to say that it wasn't from a lack of superb performance by each and every one of you. Having said that, um, it was interesting, this exercise. It was, uh, and what I found so wonderful about it is, these are cases that are going to come through the courts. They're wending their way through the courts right now. The first issue on, um, on these CAD designs, um, as one of you pointed out, New Jersey has a similar law, and that's already in the courts. With respect to the second issue, it was one that was raised by a cert petition, if not a year, two years ago. And so it's down there percolating. Um, whether the fact scenario that arises before us will be identical to yours or not, I don't know. But each side had uh, 
stronger arguments on one question, weaker arguments on another, uh, and it, it was a really well done exercise. Having said all of that, please remember that by choosing a winner of each category, it should mean nothing to the person we haven't chosen. You perform just as well. The difference was a slice. <laughs> I couldn't help that. <laughs> Best oralist, Max Gottschow. <laughs> Best brief, petitioner, the Grace Murray Hopper Memorial Team. and best team overall petitioner. I echo my thanks to all of the Ames teammates who worked so hard to put to this together to all the faculty and judges who were a part of the various stages of the competition, to all the participants. Um, this kind of teamwork is something that stays with you for life. Judge Elrod told you her story, but she's absolutely right. Those who weren't chosen tonight will be sitting in very important positions someday and remember her story. Thank you all for a wonderful evening.